All okay, right. Hi, everybody. So we are here for um, our session with Ann Morrow, and Ann will be talking to us about archiving student-authored video games in the digital age. So, Ann, take it away. Yes, thank you so much, and thank you for your patience. Um, so I'm going to give you a um, project overview. It's a project we've been working on for about um, well, over four years now, but uh, the meaningful history is really the last four years. Uh, there's a video game design program at the U. It's got both bachelor's degrees and graduate degrees. It's doing really well. In 2019, it was ranked number four in the Princeton Review of uh, Game Design Program, and it's consistently ranking high. Um, and, and just seeing how many uh, video games are published uh, you can see how from 2018 to 2020, there was just an, a huge number of video games uh, that had been produced by the program. It, it, it revealed the increasing popularity. So um, anyway, in 2008, when the program started, there, there was no archival plan in place and no preservation plan in place. Um, and their graduate students were earning master's degrees. And uh, several of the faculty members were concerned about the legacy of the game uh, that had been really a start of the program because they were beginning to decay and, and fall into obsolete uh, format. So in 2018, and, and the program was like 10 years old at this point, a uh, conversation started with the library about how, how might we address um, this uh, student authored video game design content. And so I just wanted to show you um, sort of visually, uh, since we had initially began a conversation that we've gone from a program that had 30 video games to one with over 120 today. Um, and if I were to guess this year, there were probably another 15 games um, that the program produced. Uh, so what I did initially, because uh, we were dealing with uh, games that had already become obsolete, is I created an archive. And the archive uh, is just a kind of a brief record for all of the video games that have been produced throughout the program's history. Um, and this at least allowed us to capture, to some extent, what had already been published by the program. Um, so it's been a fairly popular archive, um, but uh, I don't know what's going on with the best of, of Neptune, but it is definitely a heavy hitter. So I wanted you all to see what a typical uh, metadata record looks like in the EAE archive. Um, so here's the record. It's uh, it's got all the team members. Each one of these members is a graduate student who uh, earned a master's degree for their role. Um, and in the description, um, we've got uh, what their specific roles were on that team. Um, and I also like to include uh, a link to a playthrough, something visual, so that you can read the description, but you can also see a little bit of the gameplay. Um, so frequently, YouTube will be very useful in um, that regard. Uh, however, all of this information is collected by a librarian. So one of the things that we have to think about when thinking about sustainability is as the program grows, uh, the burden of doing uh, this cataloging work, even though it's very brief, is, is going to grow as well. Um, so when uh, we think about video games, um, the archive is, is a way of sort of capturing the footprint of the program itself. But if we think about how are we going to archive and preserve a video game, we needed to break it apart and just make a distinction between the video game as an experience, an activity that's very user centric um, versus a video game as a collection of files or uh, files on a disk or in a zip folder that are required in order for that game to operate. So. Um, 
with the files, uh, that needs um, digital preservation handling because of all of the um, vulnerabilities that digital media has. And so the object of the files would be treated with a certain sort of preservation action, um, whereas the experience of gameplay itself, we would try and capture that um, through, for example, links to the YouTube videos or making recordings at um, the EAE program events. So we thought along those two separate lines initially. Um, and in doing that, we created uh, basically a student author permission form and um, training components to help guide students through a process of making decisions about copyright and making decisions about access. Um, did you want to limit access to the campus? Do you want to make it more openly available? Um, what exactly do you want to create access to? Um, marketing materials or do you also want to have more extensive um, collection of our archi archival material, for example, um, using the library's video uh, lab to do recordings of the game design creation experience. Um, so uh, we wanted to build into this form basically a way for the team to customize depending on what they felt comfortable with uh, in terms of archiving their game. Um, and then for the object itself, the game files, uh, we created a um, submission form for the data repository in the IR. Um, the most sustainable way for us to collect video game files is to keep them in their original zip file and to put them into the Ex Libra Rosetta digital preservation system. Uh, in other words, not opening the zip file and breaking the individual files apart and you know trying to uh, funnel those individually into Rosetta, but keeping that zip um, file as the uh, preservation object. So here are some stats on how this form has gone over. Um, and uh, what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that for the efforts of setting up a way to preserve um, video game files and for the concerns that the faculty have had and considering the number of games that have thus far been published, we've only been given six video games thus far. So there, I, I or five actually, there's not, there has not, nobody's been beating down the door. And so um, there was a claim that we, we want to preserve these. This is the demand uh, to preserve them. So we've created an infrastructure where, you know, understandably some difficult choices need to be made. Um, but as you can see, uh, students are choosing not to preserve uh, their game. Uh, files with us, at least not at this um, time. Um, so that brings me to challenges going forward. And I think the biggest one is going to be communication. We've got game design going on in a couple of different places. The GAP Lab is doing what is called serious games. These are games that are with a medical or health-based function. It's a function of uh, sort of being an aid or a therapy. Um, and, and that's aside from the EAE program, which is more general uh, game design. Um, so two different libraries are also supporting those programs. And the two different libraries have different ideas about whether or not video games ought to be preserved and how to do them, and so or how to actually do that. So there's not a communication around sustaining um, and uh, growing a program for preserving this type of scholarship. Um, I, I think as time goes forward, um, 
it will be interesting to see if uh, there is more use of the EAE archive and more demand for access to the game files. Um, but at this point, I, I think that uh, at least uh, the librarian that I work with and I are satisfied that we've created an infrastructure for students to be able to archive and preserve the game files if they so choose. And we'll just have to wait and see uh, how that trends going into the future. Um, and so finally, I wanted to leave you with a, a couple of additional resources, uh, a link to a really wonderful library guide that uh, my uh, co-author on this project uh, created. Uh, it's got training modules for the students as well as um, the archival agreement. I think, um, by the way, that the archival agreement is probably likely to go by the wayside and just be replaced with uh, the uh, data repository submission. Either students will choose to submit their game files or they won't. If they want to submit them, they'll fill out that form. And regardless of whether they submit them, the library will make every attempt to create a brief record uh, year to year for each um, game produced in order to um, represent the um, whole collection of scholarship coming out of the program. So uh, that's my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing and um, see how we are on time and if anybody has questions. Yeah, thank you, Anne, for that fascinating presentation. We do have time for some questions. So if anybody in the room, um, let's see, we don't have any questions online. If anybody in the room has questions that they want to share. <laughs> okay, yeah, if you want to come up to the microphone, I think it's on. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Kim Fleshman. I'm from Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Uh, here. And um, my question has to do with, um, is anybody asking that has done the six video games that you have uh, like for an embargo? Um, because if you're putting up that zipped file, is that accessible to people to download to play the game? And I'm just thinking, is anybody getting an offer, you know, I, I can yeah. see people even on YouTube that are playing video games or reviewing video games and that kind of thing. Um, so didn't know if they were asking to embargo it. Yeah, um, yeah, we have um, we we have these different tiers of access um, for students to select, and one of the tiers of access would be um, to limit it to. Um, campus IP addresses. In other words, you would have to be a member of the U community, or we could even limit it to the building the program is in itself, or even to just the library. Um, but they would select that kind of access, that low of a level of access. And the next level of access above that would probably be campus IP range. And then beyond that, it would be more broadly open. Um, what we have said, though, because this, we actually had more uh, students contribute their games, but they were only willing to contribute their games if we were willing to store them in a dark archive, archive, use the repository as a dark archive. And we said, you know, we're a library. We're not gonna, we're not a dark archive. You can't. Right or your scholarship here so that nobody can see it. So that was how we had a few people drop off because they just weren't sure to if they wanted to share and how much they wanted to share. Um, and so we've said, you can change your embargo however many times you want. We don't have a limit on embargo. You can put a 25 year embargo on it and nobody's gonna you know, sneeze at that. But I think it's the fact that you have 15 students trying to reach consensus on average. Um, you know, it, it, it makes it difficult for them to address. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if that <laughs> answered your question. 
She answered my question. Oh, okay. I don't know people didn't you know, work submitting them, but I think she answered that. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? What was that? Oh, I was just seeing if there were any other questions. Oh, okay. Sorry. I have my sound down too low. <laughs> okay. It doesn't look like we have any more. Okay. But I want to okay. thank you, Anne, so much for this fascinating presentation. Yeah. It was, I hadn't thought about this before. How do we preserve this technology? Uh, for the future so it's it's yeah. really interesting yeah. yeah well thank you very much it's been an interesting project and um i've always enjoyed presenting to this group on this work so thank you so much for having me yeah so we love having you so all right thank you thank you all right all right well have a good conference